So you want to know what it's like to be a cyber forensic investigator. Maybe you've seen it on TV and you just want to know what the day to day looks like. Or maybe you've seen a job ad asking for a cyber forensic investigator listing all of these requirements and you want to know is this career field worth your time or maybe you're someone who naturally like to investigate things. You're curious, you love to learn about things. So this might actually be a career for you. Uh, I've spent three years working as a cyber forensic investigator and uh, now I do something else still within the cyber security field. In this video I will share with you what it's actually like to be a cyber forensic investigator I'll share with you some of the highs some of the lows I'll also share with you what sort of degrees certification and training is required to be a cyber forensic investigator so I'll start with a story uh, of one of my uh, I guess the fun, one of the funniest investigations that I've done it was uh, a university client so a university reached out to the company that I work for they told us that they have this student she got a really high mark in one of the exams and the instructor thought that um, she may have cheated uh, the mark was suspiciously high uh, judging by her performance so I went there and uh, if you want to investigate a cheating case you need to think like a student so if you were a student how would you cheat well you can either um, write the answers on a pen and paper and you can sneak in something with you during the exam or nowadays maybe you can access the material on your mobile phone or on a laptop so so I asked the instructor how is the material taught is it just a book is there an online module so they told me that there is no book for the course it's just an online learning module there are lectures um, there are like a PDF files that you can access or some sort of slides that you can access uh, on the le online learning module they also told me that the exam was a closed book so what I did is I asked for a couple of things the first thing was CCTV footage they told me there is no CCTV footage um, inside the place where the exam took place because it was in a lecture hall but there was a CCTV footage outside that room so I could see if someone entered or left the room so I started building what we call a timeline so a timeline is it's just it's just really a document where we say this is the day this is the date this is the time this is the action that happened and that's when we can start to put a timeline of the events that happen and start to correlate the evidence um, to present them to sometimes to the court or in this case to the university so I started writing the timeline and I started by uh, looking at CCTV footage during the exam time just to see what was the student doing so lo and behold I found well, me and the instructor when we looked through the CCTV we saw that the student took two bathroom breaks during the exam time so in my timeline book I wrote down the time that the student went and left to the bathroom now, this is not cheating per se but those timelines are important it's, it's important to know the exact hour and even minute that the student left the exam hall and went back because that may have been when the cheating happened the second thing I did was to request access to the online learning module within that there are logs and through those logs I was able to find out who accessed what material at what time so uh, what I did because the logs are uh, um, really huge collection of files like hundreds of thousands of entries so it's really important to know what to look for and where to look for otherwise you can get lost within the logs so I looked for logs during that exam time and I looked for logs as accessed by that particular student um, and to, to not to my surprise but to the instructor's surprise we found that the student ID have accessed the exam material meaning she accessed particular slides that correlate to the material being tested on the exam during her bathroom break so that's track number two so during those same timelines that I wrote down first I wrote down that the material was accessed using the student ID so someone someone I can't say it's the student yet logged in using that student's username and password and accessed that material uh, that correlates with the exam so that's evidence is starting to look a little bit more clear now we kind of know what happened um, but what really sealed the deal is within those logs I was able to find that it was accessed using an iPhone and I was able to get a particular serial number of the iPhone and a particular operating system level the iOS level so this was damning evidence uh, if we look at the students iPhone and if, if it's a match you can't really refute that so I created my report and I presented it to the to the university and um, the student wasn't really happy she tried to resist and say it wasn't me it was my mom but then when we told the student that actually it's pretty clear that it was access using this and this iPhone and if you show us your iPhone there is uh, there is no escaping that um, and yeah case was closed now on to another story where things were a little bit more difficult this was one of the most difficult cases that I've worked on um, this was a hospital where they've reached out to the company and told us that they are actually being hacked at the moment so they found malware they found uh, servers that were encrypted by hackers uh, and they had two requests for us well the first one please stop and contain the cyber attack that's happening the second one is where the forensic comes in is to analyze and see how that happened and what can we do to improve so that was four weeks of nightmare because 
like we kept just putting out fires like the more servers and stuff we isolate from the hospital machines um, the more and more hackers attacked and, and encrypted and, and literally destroyed some of the hospital machines um, with that investigation it was really challenging because we were analyzing machines and uh, at some point I was analyzing some of the medical devices that were connected to the internet and some of the stuff that I found were absolutely insane like I found um, user admin accounts with one password and that password was written on a piece of paper shared by all the nurses and all the doctors and it was just open season I also found some neglected machines hooked to the hospital system that no one knew about no one took ownership of that and some of them were running ridiculously old uh, versions of Windows Server totally vulnerable so many hackers were in and out of those systems it was really really hard to just pinpoint what actually happened and the most dangerous things of all is I discovered that there were some medical equipment uh, really sensitive medical equipment connected to the internet with no password and no security whatsoever now lucky for them lucky for the hospital the hackers actually didn't do anything with those devices they could have but they didn't um, and that was a really wake-up call for that hospital to start and invest in cyber security and the reason why I'm sharing this story with you is to just see that cyber investigator can be the person looking through someone's cell phone looking through um, someone websites or emails or machine or laptop but sometimes it can be medical equipment sometimes it can be just a post compromise analysis so after the hack has, uh, has happened you just analyzed what actually happened and who did the hack and why did they do it in the case of the hospital we could never find out who did it it could have been literally anyone because it was that easy to compromise and the systems just weren't set up for us to do any forensic investigation so we contained the attack and we gave the hospital a laundry list of recommendations on how they can improve their security who knows if they followed it but that was part of the job now the third and last story I want to share with you it's a little bit dark and it can be a warning tale for anyone who wants to become a cyber forensic investigator it's actually about a colleague of mine uh, he was from the UK and he had a master's of digital forensics and a few certifications he only lasted six months on the job and the reason for that is as a cyber forensic investigator you will get a chance to work with law enforcement you may be employed by a police station or by the federal government or it depends on what you do or in our case we are a private company but we provided services to law enforcement so those interactions with law enforcement usually involve a criminal uh, and our job as cyber forensic investigators is to look through the cell phones of those criminals is to look through their laptops um, it's a very ugly job because uh, the things that you will see and the things that you will get exposed to is things that never get never make it to the media uh, you get really exposed to some of the worst things that you'll ever see in your life think exploitation things weird things think things that people can get a lifetime in prison for so that's us who need to watch this see it to the end and write details about the evidence and present it to court so that's the job of the cyber forensic investigator so my colleague unfortunately could not handle it he spent six months on the job and then he had to see a therapist he quit and now he's doing something completely different and that's a very strong warning sign for anyone who wants to embark on this career is before before you invest in a master's degree or before you invest in a credential just make sure that this job is for you because it can be very tough now the good news is uh, with the skills that you make uh, as a cyber forensic investigator you can actually pivot and do something else like a cyber security analyst or a cyber security incident responder I'll get to that in a minute but just I thought I'd give you a warning sign now if you find those stories interesting including the highs and the lows the good and the bad or maybe you're naturally someone like me I love investigating things I love tinkering with things I love building things and I love to dig deep through the evidence and find things so maybe you want to do cyber forensic as a career for you so I'll go into the training the degrees the certifications that you need to be a cyber forensic investigator so like cyber security cyber forensic investigation is a part of cyber security it's one of the specialization within cyber security so the four building blocks that I talk about in this video up there apply into cyber forensic investigation so to become a cyber forensic investigator you need all these four building blocks which is a mix of experience degree certification and knowing the right people or networking in this case in no particular order so you'll just need a mix of those experience is the most important one as I talk about it in another video but in cyber forensic investigation you need some niche skills to do the job so you may need a little bit more training than your usual broad um, security analyst role for example so the first two certifications that I like to present to you they are vendor neutral they are the SANS GAC GCF and the SANS GAC GCFE those are almost the gold standard standard for cyber forensic investigation uh, the SANS GCFA cyber forensic analyst it focuses on the SANS methodology of responding to an incident it will teach you how to deal with the chain of custody how to draw a timeline but it focuses a lot on in-memory
Library Forensic, uh, while the SANS GCFE, it focuses on Windows Hard Drive Forensic. Within Digital Forensics, uh, there are many, many specializations, and you may not need to learn all of them, but at some point, you need to be exposed to them. So think about analyzing uh, an iPhone iOS versus analyzing an Android. So two different skills and sort of do two different to set of tools. Maybe the skill is the same, but just the tools are different, and you may need to learn a lot on the job, but the methodology is the same. So you learn the methodology in the SANS courses, and then you apply them through various different tools. Um, think uh, there is Windows hard drive analysis, then there is Mac OS analysis, there is memory forensic analysis, there is so many things, and there is web browser analysis, so there is many, many layers to it. But SANS certifications are a start. I know they're expensive and the cost can be prohibitive, but I have a video where I talk about sort of three ways to get them cheaper, so make sure you watch that. I'll put a link in the description box below. Uh, but SANS can be a good start, then from there you can maybe get uh, the in case certification. So this is more about the in case software that's often used in forensic investigation. So that's a good skill to have. Now with degrees, uh, it's a little bit popular to do a master's degree in digital forensics, like in UK it's very popular, in Australia not so much, uh, but you can do a master's degree in digital forensics. And the good news is if you do a master's degree in digital forensics and then you decide I don't want to work in digital forensic, that master's and that knowledge is actually very transferable to other areas of cybersecurity. So the knowledge is not really lost. Do you have to do a master's in cybersecurity forensic? Not really, but it can help. Like if you've done everything in your power and you just need to improve your chances of getting a job, it can help. It's not a guarantee. The other thing that uh, I need to emphasize with cyber forensics is um, you can approach your local police station and ask them if they are willing to hire uh, newbies or people who want to learn. I know police departments do often hire cyber forensic investigators. Sometimes uh, the career path can be different. So some people start working as police officers and then after a few years they shift and become cyber forensic investigator where the police department will pay for their training. So that's just a different way to approach it. Just think that there are many, many ways to become a cyber forensic investigator. It's not just one way, but a very common path I've seen is people work as police officers and then after a certain number of experience they can transfer to the, uh, they call it the e-crime unit or the digital forensic unit, depends on what they call it. So those are the main ways to become a cyber forensic investigator. And as I said, if you want to know how to get the SANS certification, certifications cheaper, watch this video. And if you want to learn about what I mean by the four building blocks of getting a job in cybersecurity or cyber forensics, it's just the foundation of getting a job. This video is for you.